Evet. It's my pleasure to introduce Antoine Bois, speaking to us literally from the Lavatoire Charles Fabry at the Institut Optique, which is in Palaiso, just south of Paris, uh, on the campus of the Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, I actually met Antoine uh, in 1999 uh, in the Lazouche Summer School and uh, ended up, partially because of that meeting, joining his uh, doctoral. Uh, advisors group as a postdoc, and then watched the experiment he had built as a grad student create the first metastable helium Bose condensate in the world, while Antoine was off at NIST doing a postdoc. Uh, Antoine came back to the Institut Optique, uh, I think around 2009, is that right? Oh, it's, uh, it was a bit earlier, 2003. So I spent oh. three years in the US, yes. Ah, oh, okay, okay, sorry. <clears throat> um, and, and then there has, has built up the leading group in the world in reconfigurable optical tweezers. <clears throat> uh, and, and this has been amazing to watch, uh, built on deep technical advances that start with uh, understanding single atom physics, uh, Rydberg physics, building up quantum gates with two, atom, two atoms and two tweezers, shaping light beams, uh, I mean, single atoms may already boggle the mind, but now holographic beam shaping can create images like you're seeing here on this first slide of the Eiffel Tower or uh, an arbitrary sphere shape. Uh, so built on these foundations, Antoine's been able to, with his group, create many body models from the ground up and, and study uh, interesting phases driven by dipolar interactions including uh, the first topological phases built with cold atoms. So today he's going to tell us about many of these wonderful things. Uh, and it's really quite a pleasure and an honor to have him with us. I'm looking forward to your talk, Antoine. Thank you very, very much, Joseph. So good evening, everyone. So I don't know if it's good afternoon or good. For me, it's good evening. For you, it's probably good afternoon. Uh, so it's a real pleasure for me uh, to be here, so to speak, uh, or there. Uh, thanks a lot, Joseph, for the invitations and all the organizers for making that possible. I mean, uh, it's nice that we could keep having uh, interactions somehow despite the complicated period. So uh, as Joseph said, so all the work that I'm going to report is uh, was done at the Institute Optique, which technically is not in Paris, despite the Eiffel Tower, it's actually south of Paris about uh, 20 kilometers south of Paris on this campus of the newly uh, created, uh, recently created Université Paris-Saclay, which actually groups uh, what used to be known as the Université d'Orsay that many of you probably know, and also many grandes écoles around, which is kind of a French specificity. Uh, so indeed, what I would like to show you during this talk is uh, are a few examples of uh, how you can manipulate uh, individual atoms that you place in arrays. Uh, in order to study many body physics. And so kind of, I like the, this kind of cartoon here. So it's supposed to be me actually assembling atoms one by one uh, in order to create some kind of materials that we can study. So there are actually two things that are wrong in this uh, picture. I mean, um, usually I'm indeed badly shaved. So this is close to reality, but there is this, which is the diamond, which probably makes you believe that we are rich and that's certainly not the case. And the second thing is that you may believe that I'm indeed doing something, which is also wrong because actually there is a team of people who actually works uh, very hard to, <clears throat> to make all what I'm going to report possible. So this is a group uh, picture before the COVID. Uh, so uh, some people have not left the group. I mean, uh, and uh, we are we have shrunk a bit. But essentially, uh, all the work of these people I'm going to report uh, today. So we have two main projects, and I will try to um, to show you the connections between those two projects. But just to introduce you to the people briefly, so we have three permanent staff members. So there is Thierry in charge more of the Rydberg part uh, of the group. Igor, who joined two years ago, who is also a CNRF, uh, CNRS staff member. And we <coughs> is more in charge of the uh, optical uh, dipole uh, part of the group. So we've got a talented PhD student, Antoine, Pascal, Vincent was actually now defending and has left, uh, Kai and uh, postdocs, Giovanni, <coughs> and uh, who is the one I'm forgetting? Yeah, Daniel, of course, who has been kind of a bedrock in our group for years, and Nicola, who is almost at the end. 
Uh, it's very important to mention now, and it will become probably clear in what I'm going to say, that we need a lot of theory support. I mean, uh, AMO physics is meeting and has been uh, meeting uh, condensed matter physics for some time now. And this actually is a challenge for people like me. We had actually initially almost no training in uh, condensed matter physics. And so we really need to have strong support. And we uh, were kind of privileged to have the support of Andreas Leuschli and Hans-Peter Buschler, who are just a prominent scientist and, and theorist in the field of condensed matter physics. So I will try to show um, where the contribution uh, kicks in during the talk. All right, so uh, I should also take uh, this opportunity. And once again, times are complicated. We are looking for students and postdocs. So if what I'm going to discuss, uh, I mean, you, you like it, uh, don't hesitate to contact me and we could organize a kind of at least a virtual visit, but uh, we do our best. All right, so uh, the general framework of what we do, and of course, we are not the only one to do that. There are many, many, many groups, including uh, in Toronto. Uh, the, is the, to study many body physics using uh, synthetic matter. So this is kind of a new, so to speak, not so new any longer, but which is less than 20 years, a new field where people are trying to use the control they have on artificial system that are man-made, if you wish, uh, and created for special purposes to study properties of ensembles of interacting quantum particles. Those properties, of course, many of them we know, and they were uh, they, they were really discovered way before we could assemble these artificial systems. I mean, this comes from superfluidity, superconductivity, the study of the magnetic properties of some oxides or some magnets, but also, and this is for the traditional AM of um, condensed matter physics realm, but of course, you also have high energy physics and uh, cosmology as well, with a neutron star, for example, which are objects that <coughs> are governed by um, the, 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 the fact that they are made of interacting quantum particles. Uh, what are the questions that people ask usually in, in context? I mean, they are asking what's the phase diagram, which is to say what is the ground state properties of the system. Uh, sometimes they ask what happens if you shake the system, so if you quench or vary suddenly a parameters that governs the system. So which is to say you induce a dynamics and you want to follow it. And the reason why uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's, so hard question is that in many, many cases, uh, we cannot actually calculate that, especially if we have a large number of particles, typically larger than 40, almost no ab initio calculation is feasible. Doesn't mean that we don't know how to describe some aspect of the system, but uh, from others, it's actually uh, extremely tricky to, uh, to describe the situation when you've got strong interactions in the system. Other questions that emerge as well are what is the role of topology? And in particular, if you mix topology with interactions. There also, we know a great deal of, uh, of interesting physics, but there's many which is still unraveled. And there are questions that traditionally do not belong or did not belong to the realm of condensed matter physics, for example, which is what is the role of entanglement? Uh, how do you characterize that in those large systems? I mean, it is still striking to me that if you open a textbook in condensed matter physics, you will almost never find the word entanglement. I mean, uh, despite the fact this is kind of an old context, uh, concept uh, in condensed matter physics, but if you open Ashcroft and Mermin, if you open uh, Kittel, you will not find that. And even in newer versions, it's hard to find this word. All right. So, uh, because all these questions are in many cases uh, still open, uh, even in systems that uh, have been discovered a long time ago, uh, came this idea, which was initially suggested by Richard Feynman, of trying to engineer your own system uh, that uh, allows you to answer these questions. So in a sense, we use the experimental control we have gained uh, in order to implement the specific many-body Hamiltonians that we believe describe the situation that I've mentioned here or many other that I have not mentioned. One thing which is interesting is that those many body Hamiltonians are not necessarily idealization of real life uh, materials. They could even be uh, purely abstract uh, constructions that uh, theorists came up with in order to shed light on the exotic topology or whatever. So, I mean, now we, we, we are able to engineer even these exotic uh, many body systems. And of course, one appealing feature of this approach is the fact that contrarily to what happens in many cases in condensed matter physics, there you've got a handle, you can control and tune the uh, system 
much better than in many cases. So for example, something which is very appealing with cold atoms is the fact that you can vary the interactions between the atoms and therefore study some kind of crossover, which otherwise are hard. I mean, in the electrons interact in a solid and it's very tough to, uh, almost impossible to switch off uh, their contribution. All right, so uh, when we, th so this is kind of the general framework. And of course, when we, th we speak about uh, many body systems, <clears throat> kind of the very first one that come to, more, to our mind usually is an ensemble of interacting spins and make it simple, we just take spin one half. Uh, and those ensembles consist of particles that carry the spins and those particles can be pinned in space. So and that's even simpler. We do not even worry about the fact that they can move <clears throat> Uh, we just assume that they are uh, motionless. And so people have written many Hamiltonians in order to describe this. I mean, two typical Hamiltonians that people write are what is called the Ising model. So this is an Hamiltonian that describes a sigma z, sigma z, but it is described by a sigma z, sigma z interaction. So sigma z is the usual Pauli matrices. And essentially this means that if the two spins are pointing in the same direction, the energy is different from if uh, it's pointing, uh, they are pointing in opposite direction. So it's a diagonal interaction, so to speak. Another type of Hamiltonian that is often uh, written is what is called, the, it has never, different names, but it doesn't matter. So the XY model or the exchange model. <clears throat> it's an Hamiltonian that writes sigma plus sigma minus plus sigma minus sigma plus. So these again are the Pauli matrices and it, it explains actually this kind of flip-flop interaction. So one spin goes down while the other one goes up and vice versa. All of them are characterized by this uh, constant that can be uh, <clears throat> arbitrary uh, values. Of course, when we encounter those, uh, those Hamiltonians, usually it's in the context of magnetism because this, this is where they were introduced initially to understand the bulk properties of magnetic, uh, atom, magnetic uh, oxides or alloys when we know the microscopic properties of the electrons. But also, especially for the XY model, uh, they are used in order to explain uh, or to describe the transport of excitations in systems. And so one example, which may not have nothing to do with spin models is for example, trying to describe photosynthetic process where actually the light is collected by some cell, uh, the chloroplast, and essentially the energy which is dropped by the photon is carried from this place, the light harvesting place, to the place where a reaction is going to take place. And so this can be described using this flip-flop Hamiltonian. Another, uh, situation where it actually is a useful description is the problem of scattering a light of an ensemble of atoms. And I will actually show you some examples later in the talk. And you also have like the propagation of excitons through uh, organic polymers, I will tell you was later. So uh, if you want to realize this system in a lab with a, in a synthetic way, you need to have a system or particles that can code and encode those spins and carry the spins. And there are many, many artificial systems that are being proposed and I'm not going to discuss them. I mean, you know many of them, atoms that can be put in optical lattices, uh, atoms that can be in a gas and that can have permanent uh, magnetic uh, properties. Photons can also uh, be interacting. I mean, I was discussing with uh, Ephraim uh, earlier on and this is certainly a place where uh, they're looking at this. Uh, you can have all this realm, which is a bit more recent of artificial atoms that to a certain extent act exactly as real atoms with, that you can describe by two level systems, for example. The kind of system that I'm going to describe and that we have developed over the years uh, at the Institute of Optique uh, is uh, an ensemble of atoms that we place in optical tweezers. So this is a, those are arrays of atoms placed in space, uh, positioned in space at very particular location and we can make interact as I will try to show you. So the initial idea is actually reasonably simple and it was uh, demonstrated for the first time with individual atoms by Philippe Grangier at the Institute d'Optique, so around 2000. <clears throat> and it consists in taking a laser beam, low power, a few milliwatt of laser light that you, sh you focus very tightly using a large numerical aperture lens, so lens uh, which allows you to focus the light on a spot size, which is typically one micrometer. And if you choose the parameters correctly, this acts as a trap, this light acts as a trap for an atom. And so uh, in order to load 
this trap, what we do is we place around the trapping volume an ensemble of cold atoms using the techniques that uh, Joseph or Ephraim are using in their labs, so magneto-optical traps, uh, that we cool down to temperature typically in the 100 microkelvin range. So I mean, much hotter than actually uh, what uh, Joseph has, for example. So for us, it's just cold atoms, not ultra cold. And we use this reservoir of cold atom, for this uh, cold atom cloud as a reservoir for the small trap. And so at the same time that we have all the lasers ensuring the cooling on, we collect the light that is coming from the region where the atoms are su is supposed to be trapped in this uh, tweezer here. And we collect that on a CCD camera. And uh, I will show you uh, some movie in a minute. But essentially, what we have is that the we can place one and only one atom in this. So now, uh, by the way, the atoms we use are rubidium. It doesn't really matter for what I'm going to discuss, but this is uh, one element from the first column, obviously. Uh, and one, uh, of course, so this is how you get one atom. But now, if you want to have uh, many atoms and, and create arrays, we are going to use holographic techniques. So here, the idea is that in on the path of the beam that is going to be focused and uh, create the trap here, we place a spatial light modulator, which is controlled by a computer. So essentially, it imprints a phase pattern like this one, which is encoded between 0 and 2 pi, uh, using liquid crystal. And what you have in the focal plane of the lens is the Fourier transform of the phase factor. Okay, And in this way, we can create many different geometries of trap. So what you see here. And, and there are lots of details that sweep under the rug, but essentially we can arrange in any arbitrary patterns with up to 200 atoms now, uh, the atoms in this kind of configuration. So what you can see here, each of these bright dots corresponds to the fluorescence of one and only one atom, each being trapped in one tweezers, this, uh, and this uh, special light modulator creating this diffraction pattern if you wish. So we can create this kind of honeycomb type of lattice. We can create this kind of one dimensional system with uh, up to, to 209 atoms, so fairly large system. Uh, the typical distance between the atoms or the traps is on the order of a few micrometers. We can even create totally arbitrary patterns. So for those of you who wonder what is this kind of bizarre uh, pattern, I mean, this is the pixelized version of uh, the, the Mona Lisa in the loop. So now that we cannot visit museums, we have to create our own museums. Because... And uh, as uh, Joseph was saying, so we can also arrange them in three dimensions. So just to have to be careful here, all these images are single shot images, which means that all the traps are filled and arranged in a given way. Here, it's an average image. So it means that the traps are not all filled at the same time. But if we wait long enough, we kind of average the fluorescence, which makes you believe that they are all filled at the same time. OK, so this Eiffel Tower obviously is useless for physics, but this kind of structure mimics uh, Fullerene, for example. So we could look at uh, uh, 3D physics uh, in those structures. OK, so this is what we start from. So uh, and from now, what I'm going to do is to use this platform to explore uh, different uh, situations. The first one is going to be the exploration of the traditional quantum magnetism using uh, the Ising model when the atoms are placed in a Rydberg state and interact uh, via van der Waals interactions. Uh, then I will show you how we can use the other type of interaction, the dipole-dipole, the resonant dipole-dipole interaction, this exchange interaction, uh, to engineer topological situations. And finally, so I will try to make a break, most likely at the end of this uh, part here, that you can ask questions. And then uh, after the topology, I will move to a different topics where there will not be Wittberg any longer, but we will use uh, the resonant dipole interactions between optical dipoles. And you'll see that it's a useful light matter interface with also some kind of fundamental questions that despite the fact they've been explored since a long time are still uh, open. All right, so let's start with the uh, magnetism. So here we have a lot of theory support from Andreas Löschli and his students, Michael Schuller and all the team in Innsbruck of Andreas. And the idea is to explore and implement the Ising model using these van der Waals interactions. So once again, we have this array of atoms. So essentially, <clears throat> each of these dots is one atom separated by its neighbor for from its neighbor by five micrometer, by a distance typically in the order of five micrometers. So the atoms are too far to interact. So if you want to make them interact, you need to make somehow atoms interact at large distance. And there is a way to do that, which was initially introduced in the years around 2000 uh, by uh, Misha, uh, Lukin, and Peter Zoller, is to excite the atoms to Rydberg state. 
So reverse states are highly excited uh, states, so state with large principal quantum number. And in this model of Bohr, essentially, they correspond to the electrons having very large orbits around the, the, the nucleus. A large is really, really large, actually. For the typical principal quantum numbers we have, the size of the orbit can be as large as one micrometer. So it's actually fairly, uh, <clears throat> fairly incredible. And so they have two properties that make them interesting. The first one is that when an atom is placed in the Rydberg state, it has a very long lifetime, at least very long if you compare to low-lying transition, so typically larger than 100 microseconds. So it may not sound like a lot to you, but you will see that it's enough to explore many body physics. And the second important property is the separation between the plus and minus charge results into large dipole matrix uh, element, which scales like, like the square of the principal quantum number. And so the consequence of that is that the atoms having large dipole moment exhibit large dipole-dipole interactions. And the typical number for the atoms we use is that if they are placed at 10 micrometer distance for n, the principal quantum number around 80 or 60, whatever, the typical strength of the interaction is in the range of a few megahertz. And that's very important, this uh, energy scale, because it's, it means that the dynamics driven by the interaction is sub-microsecond, which indicates and which tells you why this lifetime of 100 microseconds can be considered as essentially infinite on the time scale of the dynamics driven by the interaction. So that's the reason why we can explore the role of the interaction on a time scale, which is much shorter than the lifetime of the atoms. <clears throat> okay, so if you just take two of these Rydberg atoms, they essentially have two ways to interact with each other, and I'm going to use uh, the two interactions and try to illustrate that. They can either interact by a van der Waals interaction, which will then implement the Ising uh, model, or they can interact by the resonant dipole interaction, which I will introduce, and then it's the exchange interaction, the sigma plus sigma minus type of interactions. So let's start first by the van der Waals. So, <clears throat> The van der Waals interaction that we're going to consider is what happens if we place the two atoms in the same Rydberg state. So let's say each of them is in the state ms. Then the van der Waals interaction tells us that this doubly excited state, the one with, with each atom in the same Rydberg state, is shifted in energy by an amount which is C6 over R6, so the typical van der Waals interaction. The thing which is kind of impressive is the scaling of the C6 coefficient with the principal quantum number, which is typically n to the power 11. So it means that when the atoms are in the ground state, they've got n equal typically 5. And when they are in the Rydberg state, it's more than 50. So you enhance the strength of the interaction by a factor 10 to the 11. So it's a huge, uh, it's a knob which has a huge effect uh, and means that the interaction is switchable. In the ground state, the atoms do not interact at 10 micrometer distance. In the, in the Rydberg state, they do interact strongly. So now if you want to describe that by some kind of effective Hamiltonian, you're going to write something which has an Hamiltonian which has this form, a C6 over R6 times N1, N2, where N1 and N2 are the Rydberg occupation number. So it means that unless the two numbers are one, meaning that the atoms are in the Rydberg state, this, the effect of the interaction is negligible, which is exactly uh, what uh, I told you, which is they only interact strongly if they are in the Rydberg state. So this is the effective Hamiltonian describing that. And based on this, we can implement the Ising model in the following way. First, we need to excite the atom to the Rydberg state. And the way we do that is by using a two photon transition. So essentially piling up a blue laser and a blue photon and a red photon for 20, 10 micrometers. So we shine the light over the entire array. We can also make it selective, but for what I'm going to discuss, it's not important. For any practical purposes, we're going to ignore these details of the AMO structure, which is of course important experimentally. And we're just going to say, well, this is a spin one half system. Ground state is spin down, upper state is spin up, and they are just coupled by this, uh, this coupling, which I will uh, name by the Rabi frequency omega, which is just a number we can tune experimentally. And so now, if I want to describe, uh, write the Hamiltonian that describes this ensemble of atoms, which uh, is illuminated by the laser, laser being detuned by delta with respect to this transition, and the atoms being able to interact via the van der Waals interaction, this is the kind of Hamiltonian I'm going to write. What do we recognize? We recognize the drive by the laser. So it's going up uh, from down to up. 
it's uh, with a magnitude omega, the Rabbi frequency, and a matrix uh, that describes that, which is the Pauli matrix sigma x. Now, the detuning in the rotating frame, it looks like an h bar delta times the number of excitation you place here, or sigma z if you prefer, it's almost equivalent. And then you've got the Van der Waals part, which is uh, the part uh, which describes the interaction between uh, pairs of atoms. And so this Hamiltonian is exactly the one that you encounter in a quantum magnetism, or if you want to, to write a lattice, uh, I mean, a gas on a lattice type of Hamiltonian. So spin-spin interaction, this term, longitudinal magnetic field on transverse magnetic field. So this is how we do this mapping in a situation which essentially has nothing to do with uh, an interaction between electrons. Okay, experimentally, of course, we can tune the parameters. We can tune the ratio, especially of the transverse magnetic field to the interaction strength. How can we do that? Well, either we modify the, the, the principal quantum number or we change the shape of the array or we modify the power that we send into the lasers. And typically we can then move from the regime where the atoms are non-interacting, where the regime where the interaction overwhelmingly dominates uh, the physics. So I'm going to illustrate that on one particular uh, example that we are doing right now, which is trying to implement in the lab uh, the 2D Ising model. So you have to realize that actually it's the first time it, this model, which is an iconic model uh, of spin, has been implemented really in a lab. Because I mean, of course, there are realization in condensed matter physics, but they are only a partial realization because usually in 3D structure, for example, you have the planes that may have a square geometry, but that talks to each other. So it's hard to eliminate or to isolate only one. So the, the, the pure implementation of the Ising model has only been done extremely recently. Yeah. Um, so just take a square ray. Uh, distance between the, the, the traps is uh, A. Uh, all this gray thing means that the atoms are in their ground state. Now we're going to uh, work in a situation where just the parameters in such a way that the strength of the energy, C6 over A6 for the nearest neighbor, is on the order of the strength of the transverse magnetic field. And the meaning of that is that in a sphere or radius A, essentially, when you are here, you cannot excite two atoms at the same time. The interaction strength is just too, too strong. So essentially, it looks like a, a hard sphere into which you can only put one excitation. And so now if you ask yourself, if I place many of these Rydberg excitation here, what is the, 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 the configuration that I can write, which still has zero energy, doesn't cost any energy? Well, this is actually this kind of staggered configuration where you fill every half uh, of these uh, arrays. So essentially no interaction here. This one does not interact because it's too far, more than the, the, this, uh, this distance here. Therefore, there is no interaction if you assume nearest neighbor. And so the, the, the ground state, if you wish, the state with the lowest energy is this one. It's actually not entirely true. There are two of them. You can have also the staggered configuration, uh, which is this one. So now, if you look a bit more in detail, and this is uh, actually much more complicated, people have written the phase diagram, and it's actually only known by numerical method, and it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not analytical for the at zero temperature. So this quantumizing model is as a phase uh, phase diagram where you plot delta omega and you plot the lowest energy uh, of the system, and you find out that there are two regions, a region which is called a paramagnetic region, where essentially the atoms are going to get polarized along the field, the effectic fields, uh, which is to say uh, that they will gradually be transferred from ground to Rydberg. And there is a second order phase transition here, which isolates a region where the atoms are supposed to be uh, in an antiferromagnetic phase, which if you are sitting just on this line is exactly this nail phase, which I've represented here. Okay, so now uh, if you want to drive the system into this phase, one popular method that were, was proposed about 10 years ago in this context is to sweep the parameters. So essentially the Rabi frequency and the detuning so that uh, we can explore the phase diagram. So starting from all the atoms in the ground state, we switch on gradually, slowly, adiabatically, so to speak, the parameters so that we drive the system across the phase transition and map it somewhere here along this axis where it's supposed to be in an L state. 
Of course, it has to be done slow enough, and there are some criteria with that that are harder to fulfill when you have large system. But let me just illustrate that to you uh, on this 10 by 10 array. So this is the initial state. So we look where the atoms are. Each of the atoms is preparing the ground state. And at some point, we sweep, as I was just describing to you, the parameters, omega and delta, and we make a measurement. Okay, measurement meaning we look at what are the atoms that are in the Rydberg state on the one that are still in the ground state. And this is what we find. Um, so essentially, you've got holes here that you, the atoms were present. And in our case, a hole means we have excited an atom to the Rydberg case to the Rydberg state, huh? because that's the way we do the detection. It's a destructive uh, method. So you can, you can see here that we are missing every half atoms, which indicates that we've placed Rydberg atoms every other traps in a staggered configuration. And so this is a perfect nail uh, state that we have here. OK, of course, when I show that to you, I, I kind of lie, because I made you believe that it happens all the time. This is not the case. I mean, if you repeat the experiment many, many times, essentially, you've got this nail state 1% of the time, OK? So you need to repeat 100 times in order to get the pure, perfect uh, nail uh, configuration. But still, it's kind of uh, striking, because it means that out of the 2 to the power, um, <clears throat> sorry, to the power um, 100 configuration, you do have, with 1%, those extra a state that pops out. So it's still kind of amazing that out of this immense silver space, we are still able to isolate essentially and make those two states, the two nail state, dominate. And so this is the histogram uh, that we measure. OK, so uh, you can also ask yourself, and that's another quantity uh, that I'm not going to be to make a big fuss of it, but I mean, it's an important quantity to characterize many body system. You measure the correlation function. So essentially, you ask yourself, if I have a spin up at a given place in the array, what's the probability to have a spin down at a site k with respect to this one? So it's a two-body uh, map. Uh, it's a two-dimensional uh, map. And essentially, blue and red means, so red means that it's a positive correlation, and blue means it's a negative correlation. And what you do see here is that, indeed, you've got shells of positive and negative correlations if you average over many, many repetitions of the experiment. So you do not always have the nail state, but still the correlation you extract is almost perfect. And as a matter of fact, if you extract the correlation length, it has the size of the system on this thing. So it means that it's, a, it's actually a pretty good anti order that we've created. So I should say that this kind of thing have also been seen in one dimension, uh, especially in the context of Rydberg by Misha Lukin. Uh, a few years ago already. OK, uh, so now, and this is just in form of an advertisement, because I'm not going to say anything out of that. What we are pushing also uh, those days is trying to implement this Ising model, not on square away, where it's relatively well known, although there are qu open questions on the exact uh, quantum phase transition, but going to a triangular geometry for which you have uh, what is called a geometrical frustration which is to say that uh, if you have two spin uh, that have anti order, the third spin that you place on a triangle can be in any superposition. So it leads to a ground state degeneracy, which is exponentially large with the number of atoms. And this is a, a regime which actually is extremely hard to characterize experimentally and which has never been seen in a very clear way in a quantum regime, even in condensed matter physics. OK. so. Um, it's 22 minutes, maybe, if you wish, we could have a short break and you ask questions so that it's not too boring for you and only me talking. So, <clears throat> Okay, great. Uh, one question that's come up is, is there a way to switch the sign of the coupling constants? Ah, uh, you mean the J, the, 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 the Van der Waals, the C6 coefficient. Okay, it's a very good question. And uh, yes, there is, but not completely freely. What I want to say is that the C6, uh, the sign of the C6 coefficient depends on the uh, atomic structure. So in case of rubidium, for example, for any n above 38, if I'm remembering correctly, C6 is, uh, is, uh, is negative and above it's positive. But, and, and that's the trick of the thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we are talking of an isolated system. So whatever the sign of the system, it's either the highest uh, 
energy, the, the, the state with the highest energy or the lowest energy. But if it's an isolated system, there is no notion of temperature bringing you to the ground state. It's just an adiabatic drive of the system into one of these states. So you may as well put it in the highest uh, energy uh, state, which is the antiferromagnetic, if uh, V is, for example, a positive. You see what I mean? So, so the sign is not so important because at the end of the day, it leads to the blockade physics and the blockade physics doesn't matter, doesn't uh, rely on the sign of the interaction. Great. Uh, one more question. I noticed you plot this versus the Manhattan distance, which is a name I love, uh, <laughs> but that means that you're treating sites which are five by five away, the same as a site which is 10 by zero away. And those aren't the same distance. So no, the fact yeah. that these correlations stack up by the Manhattan distance. Um, okay, so, so that's true that this plot is in Manhattan distance. There was a huge debate with the theorists because I, to tell you the truth, I didn't know about this distance until a few years ago. So the theorists uh, love that apparently in condensed matter physics. It turns out, and so that's how we had plotted that a few years ago when we did the very first attempt. Uh, now the theorists are thinking back and they prefer to actually have the real Euclidean distance, in which case the correlation length would be a bit smaller. So I haven't really understood why they were pushing for this Manhattan distance. Uh, it's more in interesting, this Manhattan distance, in when you look at the propagation of the correlations, because between these two points, you may have different paths. So it's, it ends up in the same path, but you've got different Manhattan distance, uh, while the Euclidean would be the same. So it's more in the context of growth of correlation in the system that they introduce this distance. And uh, one final question was uh, a much more general question about whether anyone in your lab or other labs uh, use uh, atomic systems for, for dark matter detectors or uh, are, these, are these atoms? Yeah, I'll stop. Um, Okay, so the Rydberg atoms, um, I, I, I don't think that I've heard of anyone who has tried to use them as a dark matter uh, detectors uh, in a way or in another. But, I'm, but, but, but I've heard people talking about that, right? So it's not that it's totally unrealistic. Uh, the, the, the nice properties of these Rydberg atoms is that they are extremely sensitive uh, to small perturbations, uh, usually of electromagnetic origins, obviously. Um, and people are trying to launch activities uh, along the lines of using them as detectors with extremely high precision. So uh, the problem is that from the top of my head, I don't remember who I have uh, discussed with uh, about this um, possibility to look at dark matter. But so I wouldn't be able to elaborate more. Uh, people are thinking of using this extremely high sensitivity uh, in order to make them detectors of uh, Usually it's electromagnetic radiation, but uh, something more involved. Great. So why don't we continue? Thanks. And we'll, <laughs> okay. we'll uh, take more questions uh, at the end. And so continue to type in the Q&A uh, if you think of a question. Thanks. OK. Right. So, uh, so now what I'm going to discuss is more. Um, so what time is it, Joseph? Just to make sure. Hold on. Let's... Maybe. Uh, you have maybe another 10, 10, or, 10 or 13 minutes or so. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to discuss then is uh, give you an example of uh, how we can implement topological situations using the second type of interaction between Rydberg atoms, which is um, this dipole-dipole interaction. It's resonant dipole interaction. So what we're going to do now is uh, uh, to completely ignore the ground state of the atoms, and we're just going to consider two Rydberg states. So state S and state P. So uh, these states are separated by a transition in the tens of gigahertz and it's connected, uh, those two states are connecting by a dipole and therefore it's very easy to drive a Rabi, uh, a Rabi flop between those, uh, those states. Uh, so this is essentially a microwave that you send on the atoms and you measure this Rabi oscillation, which is to say the probability that if you've prepared this atom in P, it ends up in S. So from the point of view of the interaction, what is interesting now is that you can have this exchange interaction, which is to say that the uh, dipole-dipole interaction mediates an exchange of the state of the atom. So you can prepare this atom in state P, the other one in state S, or vice versa. Uh, 
And then uh, the result of the interaction is a, swat, is a swap of the state of atom A onto atom B, which implements exactly the sigma plus sigma minus type of Hamiltonian with an amplitude which is given by the d square over R cube. So uh, of course you can always do a mapping onto spin one half as well. So you can decide that this is your spin uh, down and this is your spin up. So can we measure that in the lab? I mean, you just take two atoms in two different tweezers, you take them at a given distance. The thing I, uh, and you prepare the first atom with a laser and microwave in state P, the other one in state S, and then you measure after a given time what is the state of the atom. And you, as the system evolves under the action of the interaction, you see that they actually exchange their state uh, in a coherent way. So there is a phase shift of pi, which indicates indeed that this interaction is a coherent interaction at a frequency which you can check is a C3 over R3 interaction. Uh, the thing I want to point out because I find it kind of striking is the fact that the distance between those two atoms here for this particular experiment is 30 micrometer. And still it takes a microsecond for them to exchange. So it's very rapid interaction, a very strong interaction, uh, several megahertz at a distance, which is almost the, th the thickness of a sheet of paper. Okay, so uh, from the point of view of, uh, the, I mean, it's a dipole interaction, so there is an angular dependency, so we are not going to give you too many details, but essentially you expect from classically NM that for two dipoles, uh, the, uh, the C3 coefficient uh, goes like one minus three cosine square theta. And so you can measure the frequency of this oscillation for different inter, uh, angular angle between the internuclear axis and the quantization axis. And you do find in polar coordinate, this kind of nice uh, pattern here, uh, which uh, with the theory which fits in. And so the thing which I really want you to remember for what I'm going to discuss in a minute is the fact that there is just one magic angle for which the interaction is exactly zero. Okay, so if you, if you are just at 55 degrees roughly, then the, the two dipoles do not interact. So now I've discussed all this in the language of uh, atoms exchanging their state. But of course I could just decide that a P, an atom in a P state is just a spin excitation. And so I can use those two interacting atoms interacting via this exchange interaction as actually a simulator of a single particle that hops from one side to an, another one the particle being just a spin excitation or a P excitation. So you map this interacting system onto the problem of a single particle moving or hopping from one side to another. And so we've used that in order to implement a model which is called the, the Sue-Schrieffer-Eger model. So I mean, two of these guys actually got the Nobel Prize, uh, Eger in chemistry in 2001, and uh, Schrieffer is the famous Schrieffer from BCA theory. And the initial motivation of these people was to understand the extraordinary conduction of electrons in organic polymers. So essentially the model they develop is in the context of polyacetylene. So you have an alternance of strong and weak uh, bounds uh, and you dope the thing and you find out that the electrons move. Now, these people, have, this system has been looked slightly differently as an example of a topological model. And so uh, let me try to show you how you do this and why it's kind of topological. The idea is the following. If you want to uh, emulate this, essentially, these alternance of bond and uh, which are strong and weak, you just, what is, uh, S, S, and H did is that they just isolated two sublattices, a lattice A, a sublattice B, and they assume that you have an alternance of strong and weak bound. So they work in the tie binding limit with a dimerized model where you only have J and J prime, J being strong and J prime being weak. They've also added some extra uh, ingredient, which is that they assumed that there was no connections, no interaction inside a sublattice. And if you do so, you find out, it's called a sublattice symmetry. You find out that the spectrum, the energy spectrum of the system is symmetric. Uh, with respect to zero. And I'm going to try to illustrate that in a minute. So let's start again by uh, this kind of di uh, ensemble of five dimers. I mean, you can diagonalize exactly uh, and write the eigen energies of this system. And what you find out is that they actually uh, groups in two bands, each containing five states, because they have five dimers, and with a width which is given by the smallest uh, constant, J prime here, and a gap which is given by the strongest constant. Okay, this is one, one possible configuration, but of course I could have decided that for this finite chain, instead of ending up with the strong configuration, I end up with the weak configuration, the J prime. 
And then what happens is that you find out that two of those states are going to reach exactly zero energy. And as you see, instead you only have four, it's still on the order of J prime, but you do have at the edge, two states with exactly zero energy. The thing which is not totally obvious is that whatever the strength of J prime, as long as it's lower than J, this zero energy is always true. And you do find this kind of sublattice symmetry with the spectrum, which is symmetric with respect to zero. And the thing important is that this belongs to two different classes uh, of, uh, of the two different uh, topology of the system, so to speak. One which we will call normal for historical reason, the other one topological. And there is no way that you can move this configuration to this one without increasing G prime to the point where the gap closes. As long as so the, the existence of the gap separates the system in two different topological uh, phases. Okay, and so we want to implement that in the lab. And we want to implement that using our mapping, which is that the flip-flop interaction is like a particle hopping from one side to another, exactly implementing what I want to, to see uh, here. And so you can do that and then create those two uh, phases in the following way. I mean, uh, you want to implement this normal phase, including the fact that there is no coupling inside the sublattice, and that's exactly where we're going to use the fact that there is a magic angle for which uh, two uh, atoms exactly located at an angle of 57 degrees do not interact. So you just take two chains of atoms, make them parallel, and with respect to the quantization axis, aligning at 58 de 55 degrees so that there is no coupling inside the chain like this, but you do have an alternance of strong and weak bound. And uh, just by displacing this atom from uh, here to here, now you end up with the weak, strong, weak, strong. So you can easily tune from the normal to the topological configuration. And what I'm just going to illustrate briefly now uh, is the fact that uh, we can do the spectroscopy of this system. And we can indeed uh, confirm that we have implemented this topological system. So how do we do that? We prepare the atoms all in the Rydberg state S. And we add one of these micro, the, the microwave that I was referring to, coupling to the state P. And we measure what is the frequency of the microwave that allows us to place one excitation. So what we are doing really is probing the single excitation spectrum of the system. So this is what we get if we do that in the normal phase. So this picture here is uh, the, the, the probability to have excited an atom in state as a function of the side, so you've got here 14 side because we were doing that with 14 uh, atoms. Uh, here is as a function of the detuning of the microwave. And what you do see is that when it's, it's bright here, it means that you were able to excite the atom to the P state. Okay, so this, the, the third axis, if you wish, is the probability amplitude. Then you cannot excite, this is kind of dark, and here you should be able to excite if you were not, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's actually not possible, uh, strictly speaking, because of the symmetries of the wave function in the excited state. But what we do see that here there is a gap. What is more important actually is to contrast that with the other situation where we go to the topological phase, because there we do see just on the edge, the possibility to excite the two states. So indeed it means that we have at zero energy exactly the two states that are degenerate and that corresponds to the two edge state where the, the excitations are localized on the edge. Now we want to do a bit more than that. We want also to check that indeed we have implemented this sublattice symmetry that resulted into this symmetric spectrum with respect to zero. And here the idea is reasonably easy. Let's break the magic angle for which those two atoms, for example, would not interact, place them away from this magic angle, redo the spectroscopy. And indeed, now when we probe the system, we have found that the right side has an energy different from the left side. So experimentally, it shows that indeed the system had this degeneracy if you have the magic angle for all the atoms and you can break it at will um, if you put the atoms away from this magic angle. So indeed, this is again showing that you have the, the knob to implement or not uh, the sublattice symmetry in the system. Okay, so the question, so all this is single particle physics. So now the, the big question, and you're going to be disappointed because I'm not going to explain anything essentially, or only give you a flavor of the, the argument, is uh, you want to look at how 
you can mix this topological configuration with the fact that uh, particles can interact. But so what are we talking about here when I talk about particle interacting? The particles bear in mind that I'm dealing with in these models are spin excitations. Those are the P excitation hopping from one side to another. And it turns out that those P excitation acts like hardcore bosons. Why is that? Because actually, if you have two atoms, each of them carrying already an up excitation, it's not possible to have the hopping of one up excitation onto another atom because there is no state to go to. So it means that placing two excitation on top of each other would require an infinite amount of energy, which you do not have. And so it means that the effective, uh, the, the particle we are dealing with, those spin excitations, are actually interacting particles with infinite on-site interactions, and they are called hardcore bosons. So it's a very specific type of interactions, I do agree, but it's enough to study the interplay between topology and, uh, and interactions. So how did we do that experimentally? And I'm not going to give you too many details here. We do exactly what we had done with the antiferromagnetic phase I showed you before. We're going to sweep the microwave in order to add more and more excitations in the system. So flipping some of the spin to spin up. So in a sense, there should be a, a regime where you have essentially filled half the site with excitations. And it turns out that if you do that, you implement, and I encourage you to read the publication because it's actually a full talk in itself. We were able to implement for the first time a, a symmetry prototype topological phase, which is kind of the only possible topological order you have in one dimension in the presence of interaction. And it's not super old physics because the existence of this phase uh, has been predicted in 2012. So it's actually fairly recent. And this was the first demonstration of this using uh, these uh, Rydberg arrays. OK, uh, what are we working on now? We're trying to extend this idea of topology to uh, the regime which is more natural for many of us, uh, which is uh, two dimensions. And so uh, this is a calculation we've done with Hans-Peter Büchler. Uh, and actually, all what I've reported so far was also done with him uh, and his team, uh, where we would like to see the equivalent of edge state. So you place a P excitation on uh, this kind of array, which exhibit topological features. Uh, and then you should see that the excitation never penetrates in the bulk, but only stays uh, in the, on the edge. In order to do that, you need to have a spin orbit coupling in the system. And we've actually showed early uh, this year that it's possible to use the Rydberg interaction, but in a more subtle way, in order to do implement this spin orbit coupling necessary to see this uh, topological edge state and then to move to the interacting case. OK, uh, I will just end up on this. It will be kind of my conclusion, actually, uh, to show you that this kind of this Rydberg platform, which was still uh, you know, a tool in the lab, and it is still a tool in the lab now, is a platform which starts to be mature enough that you can envision uh, industrial applications for certain very specific problems. And so in this period, we have actually created a startup uh, in Orsay, uh, which uses all the technology that I showed you about the manipulation of uh, Rydberg atoms in order to uh, implement uh, situations which are more applied. And uh, so this startup company is just uh, starting. We're looking, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, actually, uh, I'm just a shareholder, to, but I'm not employed by the company. So, uh, but I mean, the company is hiring. So if you are kind of interested in something which is halfway between the academia and the more uh, you know, industrial uh, world, I mean, this is a nice place to do that. And uh, we are looking at applications in optimization uh, uh, for industry problems, finance problems, for example, and developing the software and the hardware solution, a bit in the spirit of what Google does, but uh, using uh, different platforms. So I think that I will stop here, Joseph. I will not talk about the optical dipole. That will be just too much food. And um, yeah, and so I'd be happy to if you have questions. Mm -hmm.